Hi, my name is Anup Patel. I'm a Associate Director at Seven Partnership, a company specialising in project and programme leadership within corporate real estate. So I guess an example of what I really typically do is to support corporate clients in the delivery of their corporate real estate strategies and that's whether it's within London and the UK or in my particular case globally with a focus on the um, EMEA, so Europe, Middle East and Africa region. I studied geography and economics at the LSE um, I think in 2006 and once I graduated from there I decided to do a project management masters at uh, UCL, so also in London, just to give me um, a bit of a broader um, exposure to property and construction. My interest in geography probably started sometime around secondary school and it was when I started learning more about urban geography and you know the politics of geography and economic factors that impact a lot of the things we see around us in everyday life you know, and as, as silly as it sounds you know I always remember some of the models around um, Burgess and Hoyt and how cities zones are developed and almost and also the the classic case when I was in school about why the ice cream man sets himself up on a beach and then another ice cream guy sets himself up a few meters down from them and clustering so all these things that we see in everyday life I thought wow this is whilst obvious is actually a lot of how the world revolves around us so I thought what do I need to do to keep to be involved in this uh, this phenomenon which is basically the world we live in and to kind of influence it so took geography um, as a choice at GCSE um, and then from then on it was one of my better subjects decided to do it at A level and again I think with some sage advice from my teachers was do the things you're good at and enjoy at university and don't worry about what you want to do as a career until you've sort of had a, had a sample of everything so I said okay I'm good at this I enjoy this so I, I found a degree in geography and economics which sort of played to both of my interests and I've quickly found that actually economics underpins a lot if not all the theories in urban geography so it was a perfect match. When I finished my undergraduate degree I kind of unfortunately entered the job market at the recession um, sort of around 2009 2010 I decided after doing an internship at a property developer um, and working on one of their student accommodation projects that I really enjoyed this kind of area I realized I could use a lot of the skills I'd learned at university and at school particularly in geography and economics and so I decided to do a master's in project and enterprise management. Um, from then I was lucky enough to get a job at a UK construction company called MACE um, and that was a graduate scheme where I was able to sort of learn I guess the tricks of the trade, how to be a project manager in construction, um, the process of how things get built out of the ground really, um, which is something you never think about when you're at school. But it very quickly became clear that how something gets built is no different to how any project gets executed and it sounds quite trivial when you say even a piece of school field work or even university research paper, it's you've got to go from an idea, building a budget, designing it, getting the right people to sign off on it and agree that what you're trying to do is, is aligned to the objectives and then you have to find someone to build it so you have to go through procurement and then make sure it gets built on time to schedule and um, to cost and to the quality that's required I mean it's fairly simple but that that was it um, my and then I've spent three years uh, three to four years at Mace had the pleasure of working on the Olympics um, for most of that time um, I then had a great opportunity to again become a bit more strategic in how I operated and that was the role I previously had at CBRE 
which was taking me into corporate real estate, kind of getting me away from, I'd say, boots on the ground to more strategizing, working with the likes of kind of heads of corporate real estate, heads of property, CEOs and CFOs of organizations around what it is they're trying to achieve with their real estate and what does that mean. So I've really, in the last three or four years, been able to understand that you know, real estate is a vehicle for most organisations. Well, it's obvious, it's where people work, um, it's where most of you will spend most of your working um, lives, will be in an office or a building of some sort, and it's what decisions and strategic decisions do organisations need to make to basically get the best out of their people and the best out of their real estate. And right now I am um, starting out a company called Seven Partnership where we are taking the best of, I guess, the model, the experience I've had at Mace and the best of the experience I've had at CBRE, but being able to offer that on a much more independent and, I guess, boutique focused uh, offering to our clients. So that's kind of my journey. It's gone from quite large companies now to a smaller, much more niche organization. I think there's quite a lot of importance that needs to be placed on geographical data. I think it's data that we all use every day, every minute of our lives right now. Um, I think maybe 10 or 15 years ago that was probably quite different. Um, it was still seen as quite niche, it was looked at maybe quite clunky data, no one really understood it. but you know, I would be lying if I didn't say that within a typical hour of my day, I'm using some sort of geographical data, you know, every 10 to 15 minutes, whether it's looking at Google Maps to understand where a property is or to understand even the trivial things like the person I'm speaking to on the phone, where are they? You know, it might say in their email, Essen, Germany, I'm always intrigued to find out where actually is this, you know, do I know anything about this so I can have a bit of a conversation with this person on the telephone. Um, right through to coming here today, just looking on Google Maps, the route, planning where I need to go, how long it's going to take, are there other options, could I get the bus or is actually cycling going to be quicker, the weather, what's it doing, where's, you know, it, our whole lives revolve around it and then Looking at it from a, from a corporate or a career or how to use it in your job, I don't think I'd be able to do my job today without having use of geographical data and whether that is not just maps. Um, I think it's having numerical skills and analytical skills to be able to analyse lots of data that are words, that are financial statistics, that are you know, survey results. All of this is still day and day of kind of what I do. And I think uh, a really good example of w how we relate from what people's perceptions of geographical data and how I use it in the workplace would be a lot of our organization, client organizations will carry out an employee satisfaction survey. Once or twice a year, they'll find out what people like and what they don't like. One of the key things is how do you build that survey and that's exactly what geographers do. We've done these surveys and you may laugh, you know, when you stood in the shopping high, high street asking all these questions to people on their um, weekly shops about where they come from and what they do. Well, um, whether you like it or not, that, those are similar types of surveys that happen every day in the corporate world to understand what is happening with their people and their workplace. So we'll take the results of that. We'll then map it onto other sort of more, far more objective, smart data. So much like a lot of GIS, we, we will collect information about how many people have entered the building on a given day, um, how they're using the space. So we'll have data based on either sensors or people doing counts of where people go in their day. How often are they at their desk? How often are they in meeting rooms? Um, how often are they, you know, just hanging out, having coffees and kind of collaborating, socialising with their colleagues. And then we match this data up with kind of market data. So what are typical rents in this area for an office of this size? Um, we look at the information on the lease of the building. Um, you know, when is it, when, when is the lease expiring? So when could a good opportunity be to make a change? Um, then we look at 
you know, all the various scenarios of how much would it cost to bring about some change, are there any concept trends or designs that we want to implement, um, and when can we kind of finish all this off. So, you know, very quickly we can get all this data, put it into a report that will tell a client, based on all this information, we think you should do X, Y, or Z, whether you should stay, but you know, employee satisfaction isn't very good, so you should probably invest in, I don't know, a new cafeteria or some new, um, far more kind of effective uh, work type settings. So couches, um, workstations that allow a lot more flexible and, and interactive working, things like that. Or actually we'll say, do you know what? The market has changed and you're actually in a good position to benefit from paying a lower rent and negotiating with your landlord. Um, and all of this is data driven. You know, no one can make these decisions on a whim. A CEO might say, actually, I want to move which is fine, but that needs to be backed up by data and someone with expertise in analysing the data, not necessarily knowing um, how to get the data. Primarily my job is to kind of analyse it, understand it and come up with some options that they can consider. And I don't think that's any different to what most people who would have studied geography or even had any exposure to it would have uh, done uh, before. So I guess the classic question is, you know, travel and being someone who's interested in geography and having a, a remit that covers um, Europe and f further afield, other parts of the world, how much have I travelled and where have I seen? I think the irony is that we live in such a connected world where I don't actually need to travel on a regular basis. A lot of my work is done via uh, conference calls, uh, screen sharing, um, telepresence, so video chat, and you know, I can travel the world in a day from the comfort of my own desk or, or sometimes when I work from home, the comfort of my own kitchen. But I still think that face-to-face -face human interaction is important, whether or not you're kicking off a project or getting to meet um, someone new. So I've had, you know, spent a lot of time in um, Sweden, in Malmo, working with a mobile telecommunications company there and that has been really interesting to kind of understand a different pace of life, to see how cultures differ, how when you work in an office in a different country, even though it's European and they're only an hour and a half away on the air, on the plane, what, you know, what are the nuances and, and the differences between how we work and, and, and they work. Uh, similarly, I've done some work in the Netherlands, in, in Rotterdam, where a um, kind of leading consumer goods company is based, so again seeing how their employees worked in that office compared to the office of that client that is based in London. And, and you, you can start to see how spreadsheets and documents sometimes will never give you the full understanding of what's going on. And a lot of our jobs are, someone's got a great idea, the data will say one thing, you'll come all the way through to executing, whether it's doing an internal refurbishment of an office or getting employees to adopt agile working and using kind of laptops, Wi-Fi, and being able to be free to move around the office or the city or to go wherever they want to. Once you go into a different country in another city and you actually see how people work and what they're used to, you realize that human beings are creatures of habit and in some cultures that's far more uh, kind of embedded and a lot more difficult to, to change. Um, you know, experiences of doing work in Germany, um, you know, they have things, they have workers' councils and a very kind of protective legislation around how, what, you know, can be influenced on, on an employee in an organisation. And, and you really see how that um, factors in. I'd say the places I really would have liked to have gone had um, project budgets allowed would have been projects that we supported on in Lima, in Peru, um, that would have been awesome, and the Philippines. So, you know, being able to crisscross across the world, um, but unfortunately just through teleconferencing and photos um, is all I've been able to do in some of these places, but I'm sure I'll be travelling uh, as my career progresses. Whilst I was working at MACE, I think I had probably the best opportunity for, for a graduate just out of university of working on the Olympics in my home city, 
um, you know, the single greatest and biggest infrastructure project this country had done to that point um, what was the Olympics. So being involved there was great. I think it was a complex project and I was working on uh, what they called LOCOG, which is the company that put on the show. So we were working for them and it was a lot more just being able to, you know, it's very rare in, in, in construction or in a project world where you have to do a project that has a drop dead date. The date of the first game, you know, the opening ceremony will not move. It's set in stone. So a lot of my job was to support with detailed plans for some of the competition venues of how we'd get them ready for the games, you know, as well as the construction activity. It was like, you know, when are all the staff going to be trained? When are all the volunteers going to turn up? Where do they have to go and collect their stuff? You know, what are the milestones? You know, when are the TV crews going to be able to have access to their commentary positions to set up and be ready for two or three days time when the first broadcasts go out at that venue? And a lot of my time was building these plans and then during the delivery of all these things was to be on site and track the progress. Now I wasn't the person going around explaining getting contractors and, and logistics to places on time. A lot of it was reporting back to, it sounds quite, well, uh, it sounds quite cheesy, but actually a lot of what the information we were reporting went into reports that went up as high as, you know, Lord Coe, as he was the chairman of LOCOG, you know, they needed to know that each of their venues were ready, were agreed to be delivered, and if they weren't, what needed to happen. And in some cases, we did report up issues, you know, weather affected some of our venues in terms of preparations, uh, procurement, there were issues, and when these got flagged, solutions were brought in, and usually it was in the form of extra funding to support um, alternate solutions to deliver these things by the start date. So I did that, and that was a really good project, and I don't think you could ever top that for, for scale, other than probably going and doing another Olympics. Um, since I've been at CBRE, I've had the pleasure of actually being seconded into a couple of the kind of the world's biggest global organizations um, and you know these are organizations that you will all have come across in your day-to-day -day life um, and to be able to sit with their employees and over the case of about 18 months understand the process of the how their real estate kind of portfolio operates how their culture operates you know where are the politics within that organisation to bring about change and then to use my area to be, to be entrusted as I guess what, you know, the, the trusted advisor that you know here is a problem we need a solution you know about real estate and so does your organisation please can you come up with it so there's a lot of kind of the realisation I had all these skills I'd started to, to acquire the knowledge about corporate real estate and could actually implement it on a number of projects and I think these are the ones in you know, Manila, in Lima, um, in Mumbai, you know, how, do we, how does this massive global organisation deliver corporate real estate projects in these, these countries? And then finally, the, the, a kind of an example of a global project at a quite a strategic level has been for a Japanese um, slash Swedish um, mobile telecommunications company um, who came to us with a simple um, proposition which was we need to save 30% of our operating costs in corporate real estate go we need to achieve this within two years and it was to me and my, the team that worked on it, it was exactly playing to our strengths we had an objective we knew when we had to get it done by and we just had a really trusting client that said use your tools and your knowledge to deliver this for us and tell us what we have to do and we to not go into too much detail, but we looked at their whole portfolio, we identified opportunities based on data of lease expiries, what the market's doing. We looked at you know, the changes in their personnel, I think they were going through a bit of a restructure, so the headcounts were being reduced, so we thought, right, you know, you've got an opportunity to downsize space, an opportunity to bring about a new ways of working in your organisation, do it all at once. And we built out a plan, a two-year plan from idea to delivery and realising the benefits of did you meet your 30% operating cost savings and this was across property in Beijing, in uh, Madrid, in London, um, San Francisco, so 
everywhere in the world and I'm pleased to say that at the end of it we, we gave the client 42% on their 30 through using you know everything around kind of good data management, good analysis, um, providing the client with multiple options before they had to make a decision, um, being on top of the delivery to make sure that the cost of projects as they were executed didn't spiral out of control and to make sure that every day we were still trying to make sure that the objective was being realised which was savings um, as well as kind of trying to provide an improved and collaborative working environment for these people. I think it's very important to consider geography as a subject at university in this day and age. I think we are moving, and the world around us is changing at such rapid pace. I think the ability to be much more analytical around multiply, multiple different sources of information and different types of information, whether it's um, numbers, whether it's maps, whether it's words, um, whether it's even just conversations in the street, I think to be able to understand all of this in the age of social media and everything is just going to make you a far more rounded individual for whatever career you wish to take um, after you finish studying. I also found, I don't think the, 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 the syllabus within Geography University has has changed massively since I was there and I do think it, it really builds on the general um, understanding you got at, uni at school and then at university you can really pin down which areas you really enjoy and which ones you think will kind of kind of push you to to challenge what's in front of you and I think I had the, ex had the benefit of being able to tailor a course around urban economics um, and, and urbanisation and focusing actually a lot on office markets and, and trends and, and, and supply and demand, which when I, I didn't really think about it at the time, but actually I'm now doing the job I probably wanted to do at the time I was at university, and it was just a different way uh, of getting there. Um, I think geography is an international degree. I mean, everyone knows what the subject means. Everyone, you know, you can apply geography anywhere in the world and people will kind of understand what you're talking about and what you're um, trying, to, trying, to, trying to achieve by doing it. And I think the rate at which the, the world is becoming more urbanised, the rate at which you know, we're having to make decisions around our environmental impacts, I think people who not only have the kind of subject matter expertise knowledge around these theories and phenomena it's actually having the skills to do something about it you know I think you can work in policy and things like that which is great to try and influence change but actually my opinion was I actually want to do the change so what other skills do I need you know do I need to be good at project management and do I need to be good at kind of managing stakeholders do I need to be a bit more worldly to be able to travel and communicate with people around the world to influence them to come along this journey and I think without doing geography I think you'd have to spend a lot of time kind of training and teaching yourself these things but actually it's part of the it comes as part of the degree and the people around you. So if you'd like to work in the industry that I work in which is I guess the built environment um, construction or property development or corporate real estate and strategic uh, advice around there. I think there are a lot of ways you can get into it and I think there are the traditional routes which would be to do a degree in surveying or construction management and graduate and go and work for a construction or building surveying company similar to what I did which is which is you know that is the tried and tested method. I think in the years that I've worked in the industry, I think there are many different ways you can get in. I think be open to the idea that if university isn't for you or you want to have a second time to think about doing that, you know, there are apprenticeships, um, there are kind of placement programs out there where a lot of the big organisations in this industry will take you on board, give you the training around the day job, but then support you through 
uh, higher education um, on a part-time basis. So I definitely think that's something to look at. Um, and the other field, the way is actually to promote kind of your interests. So I would have to say that a lot of the people that I've been responsible for recruiting in the past couple of years have been from generalist backgrounds. Um, you know, in the industry we call it non-cognate, which is where I came from, geography or history or any other subject. But they've got an interest or a desire to work in the industry to um, get involved and make a change. And again, we've seen that, we, we pick up on their enthusiasm and their skills. So, you know, we supported them through as well. So, I'd kind of say just look around you, to make use of social media, be, you know, I think we live in almost a perfect information world. You just have to Google a job or a career or to find out how something is done. And a lot of people don't realise that there are hundreds and thousands of people that support the built environment, um, ranging from not just the kind of labourers on site, um, but there are some fairly interesting kind of strategic roles out there that if you knew about them, you'd probably set a path to kind of get there. So yeah, anything's possible and just follow your interests and you'll get to potentially work in this industry. Uh, it's been a pleasure um, explaining kind of how I've got to where I have and how I've used geography and, and all the skills and the, and the data it gives me to be where I am. But I hope it's given you all something to think about, um, to realise that there is more out there than potentially you previously imagined. And um, I'd like to thank the Royal Geographical Society for giving me the opportunity to do this. And if you do have any questions around this industry or anything relating to what I've done, please do contact uh, the RGS and I'm sure we can um, follow up with you afterwards. Thanks.